Something catches the attention there in 2 Corinthians 11 at verse 3 that I think we should look at. And uh, we'll probably look at a few different times, but this is the first. And, well, there's a lot to think about, so it's okay. And we should just approach it with an open Bible and an open mind. But he said, the Apostle Paul did at 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Well, if Paul was afraid, we should be afraid. That's the first thing that I notice reading that verse. If Paul's afraid, we should be afraid. The serpent deceived Eve, it's true, and she sinned because she was deceived, which is to say she did not know or realize that what she was doing was the wrong thing. She had been hoodwinked into doing it, but she was still guilty, and uh, Adam knew exactly that they shouldn't be doing it. He wasn't thinking differently. He just wouldn't stand up. But this shouldn't be a reason to dismiss Eve. You know, she's not unintelligent. In fact, it's because she's intelligent that what the devil said to her was effective. Uh, so if Paul's afraid, we should be afraid. And we shouldn't dismiss Eve as, well, she got fooled. I won't get fooled. Or won't get fooled again, right? Sure. <laughs> uh, no, uh, she was intelligent. She knew all the scripture there was to know in the world, if you, if you like to think of it that way. All, everything that was God's will for them, she knew what it was. She had been taught. She even made a necessary inference that we're not going to eat of that tree. We're not even going to touch it. And if she had kept that, she'd have been better off. But no, uh, we shouldn't think that uh, that's a far off thing that, that doesn't apply to us. She, we're, we're better than her. We're smarter than her. That's not going to happen to me. No, that's not true at all. Anybody can commit sin with full knowledge, as Adam did, or unwittingly um, not realizing that this is the wrong thing to do, being fooled, thinking that what we were doing was the right thing to do. That can happen to anybody and it does happen to anybody. and they're, They both merited condemnation. And neither Adam nor Eve was unintelligent or incapable. That's not the problem. That wasn't the problem then. It's not the problem now either. But yeah, Paul said, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning... Your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere, pure devotion to Christ. And again, maybe you'd think, well, that's Corinth. And, you know, they were crazy. But we're not that crazy. But, you know, it's not any different, friends. You know, the Bible applies to us. We are people. They were people. It can happen. Maybe, you know, our circumstances, oh, I shouldn't even say maybe. We know our circumstances are different in some ways. <clears throat> Our circumstances are necessarily different in some ways, but we're all people. We all have the same constitution, the same spirit, the same intellect. So no, we should be afraid the way that Paul is afraid. We should realize that is a genuine danger for us, first of all. But then, of course, the question becomes... How did the serpent deceive Eve? Because he said, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray. So 
if I'm going to be inoculated against this, or if I'm going to be able to see it and be able to avoid it, it's going to be because I understand what it is and how it works. But do I? <laughs> you know, I haven't really looked at this in as much detail as I intended to come to find out as part of this study. How did the serpent deceive Eve? That's a good question, and I think is the main question for today for us to think about. Because that's the way that our thoughts could be led astray. So we should know what that is. What are the thoughts being led astray from? Finally, here is 2 Corinthians 11.3. The thoughts are being led astray from sincere, pure devotion to Christ. Sincere here is um, singleness, uh, single-mindedness, but singleness. And the thoughts being led astray really is the thoughts being corrupted, maybe rotted or decayed, but, but corrupted that our thoughts can be corrupted away from a singleness of mind in Christ Jesus. What does it mean? We'll get there. But that's an important thing to understand. When he says that the thoughts can be led astray from the purity, the sincerity, the devotion to Jesus, or the devotion that are in Jesus, and they are in Jesus, is what it says. This, hmm, this is talking about him more than it's talking about us. So we go back and look at Genesis 3 and consider. It's Genesis 3, verses 1, down to about verse 6. Yeah, Genesis 3, 1 through 6. The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you should not eat of any tree in the garden? Well, no, that's not what God said. What God said was, you may freely eat of the trees of the garden, except that the one in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that one you should not eat from. And it's exactly what Eve said. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And yes, when she says, neither shall you touch it, that is different from what was literally recorded in chapter 2, verse 17. But it's valid. It's a necessary inference. It would have saved her life. But then the serpent says, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food and a delight to the eyes and desirable for making one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was there with her. And he ate. That's what happened. How, you know, how and why was Eve deceived? Now, Adam was fully aware they shouldn't be doing this. How was Eve deceived? Well, 
Well, the devil lied. Bottom line of this, the devil lied to her. She believed that lie, and it resulted in her taking actions that were contrary to God, to what God had said. She sinned. That's the simplest formulation. And what's the lie of the devil? Well, the first thing is this question, did God say you should not eat of any tree in the garden? Well, he knows that that's not true. That is formulated to fixate the attention on the thing you cannot have. But it's also questioning something else. He said, did God really say, why did he ask that? It's because in Genesis 2, at verse 16, I'm sorry, verse, uh, yeah, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you will surely die. And then, verse 18 then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Why is that important? Because God did not say this to Eve. God received, I'm sorry, Eve received this word from Adam. Adam taught her all the scripture there was because she wasn't around for that. Adam was there. He was given the commandment. He relayed the word of God to her. And then the devil said, is that really what God said? Because that's always what the devil says about the Bible. It's still what he says about the Bible. Is that really what God said? Or didn't men make this up? Isn't it just a collection of stories? That's the first thing, because the power of God is the Word of God. So you got to start by attacking the Word. But the next thing is, she answered correctly, no, it's just that one. And the serpent said, well, you won't surely die. That's just a straight out lie. Or is it? Well, it depends on what you mean by die. They died in the spirit as soon as they sinned against God, but they didn't die in the flesh as soon as they sinned against God. So would you say that's a half-truth? Well, maybe, but a half-truth is a whole lie. <laughs> the best kind of lies are half-truths, you know? A friend of mine said, technically correct is the best kind of correct. <laughs> But the best kind of lie is a half-truth. And the devil knows that too. No, he said, oh, you're not going to die. But the real thing, all those things are true. And those are the hallmarks of anything satanic. You, you see it a mile away. We question the authenticity of Scripture. We contradict by switching term, terminology on you. Everybody can see that a mile away if you're thinking and if you're open, you're wide, you know, wide open. No, here's the trick. It's the fifth verse, the trickiest trick. Well, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, what about that? Well, what about it? It is a lie. It's a lie. Because he's telling her, look, the reason you can't eat the fruit isn't that you're going to die. The reason you can't eat the fruit is God doesn't want you to eat it because then 
you'll be like him. And he wants to keep you in the dark. That's what he's really saying. God wants to keep you in the dark, Eve. The reason that you're not allowed to eat that tree is because we want to keep you under our thumb. You are to be excluded. You are the dupe. Oh, it is what God said, you shall not eat of the tree. And she rightly captures that that is the case. And you notice the devil isn't saying, well, that's not what he said. He didn't say don't touch the tree or don't eat from the tree. No, he agrees that it says don't eat from the tree. The problem is why? Why not eat from the tree? Well, because... The day you eat of it, you will surely die, is what God said. But the devil said, no, that's not it. It's because when you eat of it, you'll be in on it. And he wants to keep you out. What's that? It's questioning God's motives. It's questioning God's motives. Why would he have us do this? Why would he have us go through this? Right? And maybe if you're a Bible student, you think back to the Exodus. Why did he bring us into this wilderness to die of starvation, we and our children? Right? There's so many echoes through Scripture, satanic echoes, but echoes through Scripture of questioning God's motives. This is how Eve is being deceived. Well, Eve, you know, bless your heart. <laughs> you know, well, you're not going to die. God knows that when you eat it, you will be like him. You know what that implies? That the devil knows that when she eats it, she'll be like him. The devil, by saying this, is lying to her, making himself co-equal to God. He and God are in the, the club of the people, the ones who know, the insiders. And he's letting Eve in on it, where God is holding out on her. Right? That's what he's doing. Oh, God told you that to keep you in the dark. You'll be like God or actually become as gods, which might refer to God as Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Or he may be telling her, either way, that you and Adam can be your own gods. You'll be co-equal to God. You'll be your own law. <laughs> this also is a lie. Either one of those would be a lie. We're not like God. Oh, we might know good from, from, from evil. We might be able to discern good and evil, but the rest of this is a lie. Yes, you die in the spirit. No, you're not like God just because you know the difference between right and wrong. There's a whole lot more to God than knowing the difference between right and wrong. That's just not even a half truth. No, that's not the trick. The trick is, oh no, that's, that's not why. The reason why is to keep you in the dark. You're being duped. That's the lie of the devil. And you notice, perhaps, in the sixth verse there of Genesis 3, the woman then saw... The tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and it was to be desired to make one wise. Did you ever notice, I didn't, that in verse 6, she saw the tree. That 
is the opposite of faith. She saw it. And it called to her, it was appealing to her, the lie of the devil that she was being, she was being duped. She looked at it and thought about it like, hmm, maybe that's right. Maybe that is what's happening. It does look good. That's how sin works. But that was done by sight, not by faith. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the word of God to her was relayed by her husband, Adam. And she knew it and she quoted it in Genesis 3, 2. Accurately. But see what she did? It was not faith. She lost her faith. She didn't trust God anymore. She questioned his motive. She didn't trust him and she started to walk by sight. But why trust the devil? It happens. And you know, the other thing that is interesting about this with the, the devil saying this, well, you know, your eyes will be opened You'll know the difference between good and evil. You know, as we said, when they partook of the fruit, their eyes were open and they did know the difference between good and evil, which they did not until that point. But that's the only aspect of that that's even close to true. But what's very interesting about this is that just like we said earlier, he makes himself co-equal to God that he knows and they're in the in club, they're in the in crowd and, and uh, Eve is, is the dupe. He's also making himself equal to God here because that is a mimicry of what it's really like to come to a knowledge of the truth from a lost estate in the world led astray to various lusts, to useless traditions handed down from your fathers. When you come across the truth, you read the gospel of Jesus, you hear that teaching, your eyes are opened and you know the difference between right and wrong because Jesus taught you the difference and it's a whole different world. It's a whole different world. The devil always mimics God. He wants to be like him. He wants you to think that he's like God. The great irony of what he's telling Eve is not, you know, the telling Eve that, oh, you'll be like God. That's not the irony. The irony is that the devil is telling her that he's like God. And she's believing it. We all do. From time to time. That's how we end up doing what is wrong. That's why Paul was afraid. You know, back there, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and a pure devotion to Christ. Well, of course, uh, we talk in retrospect of Genesis 3, we, we always go to 1 John uh, chapter 2, and that's worth doing. We should do it even now because it is sound teaching. And in conjunction with that, You'll put up 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Which says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. That's exactly what we read in Genesis 3. It was desirable. It was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. It was desirable to make one wise. That's 1 John 2, 16. Desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, pride of life. 
This is what's in the world. It's not from the Father. The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God remains forever. This is all very valid and, and worth looking at and putting together with first, or with Genesis 3. You need to do that. You need to understand it. Okay, fair enough. All it is is sin. All it is is wrongdoing. That's all we're getting at. There's nothing terribly complicated about it, although we're focused in on the mechanism because we're thinking about 2 Corinthians 11.3 where Paul said, I am afraid that in the way serp the serpent deceived Eve, you will be led astray. And we should be afraid of that too. And if Eve can be tricked, we can be tricked. So we better figure out how this happened. All of this is coming back from the idea that, you know, God is holding out on you. It's other than what you're being told. That word delivered to you is not trustworthy. Why well, they, they had a reason to say something like that. Or as they say sometimes about the preacher, well, he has to say that. That's the same exact thing that the devil is doing. But I would turn your attention to Luke 20. Craftiness or cunning. It said that the devil deceived her by means of cunning, craftiness. And there's an example of cunning craftiness in Luke 20. So I wanted to look at that with you because I think that it does a good job of, um, of making clear the mechanism of that craftiness, that trickiness. There in Luke 20, at verse 20, says the scribes and chief priests watched him and sent spies to Jesus who pretended to be sincere so that they could catch him in something he said so that they could hand him over to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. In this connection, Luke 20, verse 21, they asked him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness, and that's the craftiness by which the devil deceived Eve, and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, So render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they did not have the strength to catch him in anything he said in front of the people. Marveling at this answer, they became silent. Now, when we talk about craftiness, what the text in Luke 20 tells us is that they started from a place that was not obedient, that was not sincere. They did not believe in Jesus. They were not trying to listen to him or to learn from him. They had nobody's interest at heart except their own. They pretended to be sincere trying to catch him in something that he said that would get him in trouble with the law so they could hand him to Rome, have him incarcerated, or maybe crucified. In this connection, they start with flattery at verse 21. Why, we know you speak and teach rightly. You show no partiality at all, but truly teach the way of God. You know, the phrase for showing partiality means, in, in Greek, it's literally you re receiving a face, accepting a, a face of a person, an individual. And the reason that I say that is because their question hinges upon that. They're saying, why? 
You fear no authority. No person holds sway over you. So, why does Caesar hold the power to tax us? That's what they're doing. And so, he perceived what they were doing. But that's what they're doing. They're saying, oh, why, you're afraid of no man. But what about Caesar? So the word for trickiness or craftiness is something like falsify or adulterate. You are swapping things out. You are changing something in order to lie, in order to accomplish a nefarious end. That's what these people are doing. They do not, they do not care whether Jesus teaches without fear or favor of men. They're just trying to get him to say something bad about Caesar so that they can go rat him out and have him arrested. But the way they did this was to come to him and say, why, you don't fear men when it comes to teaching the truth, right? No man has authority, only God. And then they swap it out and say, well, why does Caesar have authority then? And just like the devil, there's a half lie. Or, I'm sorry, there's a half truth and a whole lie. And he knew what they were doing. It says, perceive their craftiness. And said there's a difference between Caesar's things and God's things. We owe to Caesar some things, but we owe to God his things. Not, didn't step into this trap in any way. The Lord didn't. But see what's happening there is to question the motivation of Jesus, to question why he's doing what he's doing, why he's saying what he's saying, and to throw in his face a principle that he knew to be true, that no man has authority over the religion of God. And it ties back to 2 Corinthians 11 because... 2 Corinthians 11.3 said, your thoughts, you know, by his cunning, your thoughts could be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. What he's saying there is they could be corrupted by this craftiness, which is an adulteration of falsification. The devil came to Eve without any idea that he held truth or that he was going to help Eve with anything. Now, the whole point was to murder her. It always was. So he lied about the words and the meaning of the words. He impugned the motives of God and caused her to doubt why God said what he did. That's adulterating, that's falsifying, that's tricking and it's the means by which we can be led astray or corrupted, corrupted or bribed even, away from the singleness and purity that's in Christ. What is that singleness? What is that purity? Is his character, his motives, This is what's under consideration. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm trying to get to James. You'll probably beat me. <laughs> Yeah. 
in James chapter 1, verse 16. No, even back, it is 13. Let no one say, when tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God could not be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. That's not what's happening. James 1, 14, each person is tempted when lured and desired by his own desire, or lured and enticed by his own desire. Desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, James 1, 16. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. That's a shadow of turning. That's the dark side of the moon. There is a dark side of the moon in the sense that the moon is always has the same side facing the earth. We never see the other side of it. He's saying God has no such thing. There is no dark side to God. There's not something behind his back that he's not telling us. It's a direct reference to Genesis 3. Well, God knows that when you eat it, you will be like him. It's not because you'll die. It's because he doesn't want you to know. That's false. There is no dark side to God. There isn't something behind his back that he's holding out on us. The singleness of God is that he doesn't have two sides. He has one side. The purity that is in him is 100% purity. He is completely what he says he is. He represents honestly and completely what is his will for us. To be corrupted away from that singleness that is in Christ Jesus is to go down that same path of questioning God's motives. Wondering why this is written so, why this is, it has to be like this. And remember that Eve received it through the hand of a messenger, Adam. just as we receive it through the hands of messengers, the apostles and others who compiled these words of God. The word of God that reached Eve's ears by way of Adam was no less binding for her than the words of God that reach us through the scriptures today. And the way that the devil attacked Eve and deceived her is no different from the way that he'll do it today. We're not better than her. We're not smarter than her. But we will question the messenger just like he did. We'll say, why are they saying that? You know, they would say that. That serves their interests. All of that kind of stuff is how things get dismissed without considering what's being said, without considering the truth of the matter, without opening things in the light of Scripture, giving God our faith, knowing that He is right and He is trustworthy, and we don't assume as a baseline that He has to be put to the test. That's not faith. There's a lot more to talk about, but... We'll stop there right now. How did he deceive Eve? Well, he got her to believe that there was more to the story. Got her to believe that God was holding out on her, that she was being duped. As soon as she believed that, she was open to trying things. See what will happen. And that's how it happens to all of us. We have more to talk about. But today, if you are not a Christian, become a Christian. Believing in God, trusting his word, you can be saved. Eve would have been if she had followed through on what she'd heard, if she had believed him. But she didn't. She believed a lie instead. And we all have at some point. But if you now believe the Lord, you believe his word, repent and be baptized in his name for forgiveness of sins. We have water prepared for you to do this. Are you a Christian? 
Listen to what Paul said. I am afraid. Are you afraid? You should be because the devil does have tricks and they are tricky. And we are not thinking about the details of the commandment that do not touch the tree. That's not where he's focused. He's focused on why not? And isn't that convenient? That's where the devil's at. Don't be fooled, Christian friend. But if in something you have lived wrong, you've made the wrong choice, repent. Let us pray together with you that you might be forgiven. As James 5 would say, if you need today the prayers of the saints or you need to be baptized, please let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.